right. Welcome back to The Next Big Thing. My name is Chris Gennady, Global Head of Research at Wisdom Tree. And today I am joined by Ofer Israeli. And we are going to be talking about uh, the journey that he has taken. This is uh, an entrepreneur, I'd say our first entrepreneur on um, the, the episode, um, someone who has founded a company. Um, so this is uh, exciting for me and I hope uh, for you as well. Uh, before we begin, I do need to state the following. To clarify, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Wisdom Tree uh, and of their Israeli and are subject to change. Anything we present in this podcast is not intended to be relied on as forecast research nor as investment or tax advice. Uh, the information and opinions expressed in this podcast are not a recommendation, offer, or a solicitation to buy or sell any securities and reliance upon them is at the sole discretion of the listener. Please remember past performance is no indication of future results. And so with that, um, Ofer, um, I was Googling around to just try to get a sense of uh, your, your background and see what uh, various things uh, you might have partaken in before. And I saw that you were bitten by the entrepreneurial bug early, possibly even in high school. So I'd, I'd just be curious to hear a bit more uh, of that uh, story of, of sort of your early entrepreneurial instinct uh, as we get started here. Yeah, awesome. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for having me here. Um, yeah, indeed. Uh, it did start in high school when a friend and I uh, basically got our programming books. We learned a little to program. And then we advertise ourselves as outsource, an outsource programming company. Um, this was back in the 90s. So it was all kind of news, uh, user groups and things of that nature, which I don't know that exists anymore. But uh, we advertise ourselves there. And we actually did some pretty significant work for fairly large American companies um, for a while there. Interestingly enough, it was also my first uh, brush of the legal world because at some point we got uh, a letter from uh, one of the largest law firms in Israel that if we continue to use uh, the registered name that we've been using unknowingly, we would get sued. So <laughs> we figured, okay, that's a, you actually have to register a name of a company or maybe establish <laughs> a company. So that was a, a little bit of a learning uh, early days in the high school. In 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 looking at it, because we uh, at Wisdom Tree, we've been uh, working with uh, a lot of interns uh, over the summer. I'm sure interns are all over the place at uh, many companies, and you, you sort of think back and you say, "Okay, you you and your friend are are, are in Israel. How?" common or uncommon was it to be thinking about programming at that time in the 90s? The reason I ask that is it feels like today everybody is thinking of programming and there are so many different languages and everybody's familiar. But, you know, in, in the 90s, sort of at the quote unquote dawn of the Internet, I, I feel like it must have been different. But uh, I, I would just be curious, what, what was it like in Israel on this topic at that time? Yeah, no, I think you're right. It wasn't it wasn't a very common kind of thing or practice. I was fortunate enough. It was actually my friend that started uh, learning and enjoying the world of uh, programming. So kind of I got the, the bug a little bit through him. Um, I don't know if things are related, you know, causation or correlation, but he also went on to become an entrepreneur. He started several very successful companies actually to date. Um, so uh, uh, maybe maybe related, maybe not, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't all that common. Um, but it was great. Look, it was interesting work. We enjoyed it uh, first and foremost, and then secondly, the benefits were outside of it being interesting work. We also got paid significantly more than working at your local uh, burger joint and uh, flipping burgers, right? So it was uh, it was doubly beneficial. I was uh, I was a life full disclosure. I was a lifeguard at uh, you know a, a summer camp. Uh, cer certainly not thinking of uh, of programming on on uh, on my side. Um, now, something else that I personally 
look at a lot, I, I wouldn't say I understand it a hundred percent, but I look at it a lot, um, is the, is the quantum computing space. And as, as I looked at, you know, some of the, uh, various synopses of, of your background, it's, uh, it said you were working, uh, for a bit of time at, uh, the atom lab, um, right, right after, uh, the sort of university period. And I, I went to the website yesterday and again, I, I won't, you know, represent that, I grasped every uh, detail because it looked like there were some highly technical things there. But I, I, would be, I would be curious to get your perspective because whether it's in the domain of cybersecurity and we're thinking about uh, encryption or whether it's you, you see certain companies, certain research organizations just trying to get people excited about what quantum may or may not be able to do. Generally, it's it's one of these topics where it's sort of always floating in the background, but you don't necessarily feel like it's in the mainstream. You don't necessarily feel like, at least not yet, that it's doing all sorts of uh, necessarily useful things. But I, since, since you had that uh, in your background, I'd love to just get your uh, cursory perspective on where you're seeing uh, quantum at uh, the present moment. Yeah, uh, well, happy to as much as much as I can share. And I say that with, uh, let me say up front, I am far from being a quantum computing expert. Um, I know kind of the basics, but um, uh, my my adventure had started on when I was studying, I was studying both physics and computer science. It was a kind of dual degree thing. So I started in the physics world. And to your point, I worked in the atom chip lab for a while, um, both as a practitioner and then also um uh, theoretician um but eventually uh it i figured i let me actually go out and try the computer science side of things and kind of transitioned over i think to your point we don't feel it on a day-to-day -day basis because like anything else it needs to hit some inflection point before we're all kind of immersed in it so you know a great recent analogy is ai right that's been around forever and now that with everything open ai and others have done um recently like the breakthroughs and the way they deliver it now to kind of everybody suddenly it's top of mind everywhere you turn right it's not this has been in works for a long time right but um so kind of similar thing i think is going to happen in the quantum world will hit a certain inflection point when then suddenly the all of us grasp what it means, what the implications are, and start to see some of the day-to-day -day, day -day applications of it. It, it needs its uh, chat GPT, quote-unquote, uh, application where you get you get that, that user adoption, that 100 million people uh, engaging in a particular forum in a very short period of time, two months in the case of chat GPT. So the, that that's absolutely something we probably at Wisdom Tree talk about every single day, um, and and so one one of the things I I was just personally curious about because uh, we we both have had uh, relationships with uh, with teammate and uh, teammate I'm sure it's no coincidence that in the Israeli military it's Unit eighty two hundred sort of the the cyber uh, unit. Uh, within the Israeli army. Um, and I know in, in Israel, different from uh, the U.S., where we're both uh, currently sitting, there is that requirement of sort of military service around the same time frame as, uh, as university. So I was, I was just curious, um, did, did you pick up anything interesting during uh, the, the service that you, you had to do uh, within Israel? Um, yeah, so we uh, indeed uh, we started my journey with a teammate, and was fortunate to to be working with them and building Elusive, building the company that I founded. Um, and uh, there was a lot of interesting insights and knowledge that the teammate folks brought to the table and still bring to the table. And they have, uh, outside of being really strong individuals and smart individuals, they also have possess some pretty unique knowledge and experience that you know most don't. Um, in my realm, I did things a little, a little different things in in my military service, which is so certainly was uh, complimentary for me to get uh, teammates' insights um, as we were working together. But one of the biggest benefits I think we brought to the table is being able to understand what attackers, how attackers think, how they operate. Right. And kind of the whole thesis behind uh, Teammate and Elusive being the first company out of Teammate 
was in order to really defend against the attacks that matter, right? The ones that will actually have a significant impact. You have to understand, embrace, and kind of challenge um, the attacker's perspective. And what we saw that is happening very commonly in the industry is that there's this disconnect between the defense and the offensive side. And the defense side, in some instances, might think offensive personnel can't do something where absolutely they can, and that's what they do, or on the flip side. They attribute sometimes kind of superhero capabilities to attackers like, yeah, they'll easily do X, Y, Z, where in reality, that's very difficult for attackers to do. And that disconnect, um, I think, is one of the reasons that we're seeing the, the cyber attackers with upper hand for, you know, forever, basically. Um, so we try to bring a very different mentality to that and say, all right, if we get the attackers, where, how do we challenge them in the places where they're vulnerable and in the places where it's difficult for them? That's what we try to bring to the table. And again, Timmy has done wonderful things with uh, quite a, a bunch of companies and brought interesting technologies and approaches to, to go about solving difficult problems. One, one thing we talk a lot about with uh, investors, and I know you, you've spent some time at uh, a checkpoint and uh, checkpoint is just uh, one example of, of so many different cybersecurity companies. Pe people listening today, they might have familiarity with Zscaler or Octo or CrowdStrike or Cloudflare, oh. you know, you name it. But um, you, you sort of step back as a, as a non cybersecurity professional. And one of the things I find that you wonder is in certain domains that have to do with uh, computers and software, it feels like you build a relationship with one company. It's, it's sort of like the, the, the Apple type relationship, which admittedly has hardware as well. And you get all your services through that one company. Whereas in cybersecurity, it feels like, you know, there's a certain aspect of email protection and one company is a specialist at that. There's a certain aspect of protecting access points uh, between say the local user and, and the cloud. And one company is a specialist at that. And bef before you know it, if, if you're a business, you have relationships with 5, 10, 20, maybe significantly more cybersecurity providers because each is sort of very good at protecting one particular thing. So I, I, I would just be curious to, to get your view on, do, do you see the industry sort of always being like that, where each little thing has sort of its particular protector? Or do you think that at a certain point in the future, we do migrate more towards uh, these more all-encompassing uh, relationships where you could have, as, as the business owner, a relationship with, say, one company, and you basically get protected, quote-unquote, uh, from all the different things. Yeah. it's it, the, the whole topic of uh, kind of best of breed versus best of suite, is, is it, it's a hot topic in cyber for a long time. Um, and it's interesting because... Certainly on the, on the customer's end of things, to your point, maintaining relationships, uh, deployments, support, and so on and so forth from dozens and dozens of different companies, as many security organizations do, is really challenging. And it's certainly suboptimal. I mean, things aren't necessarily working together in a good way. It's a lot of overhead and so on and so forth. So everybody really wants to consolidate. Um, I think uh, that where they're seeing challenges is that uh, startup companies, younger companies tend to innovate quicker than larger companies. And as the attackers aren't waiting for us and aren't waiting for it to be comfortable for us, we need to kind of push the envelope. I think there's a couple of um, interesting things um, uh, that I'm noticing. One is now, uh, with the uh, economic uh, downturn, uh, consolidation has certainly resurfaced as a bigger item. And we're seeing more and more companies actually do that. Companies have been talking about it for a long time, but now they're saying, you know what, it's with the economical situation, now is the time to do it. I have to cut down on the number of suppliers and make it uh, um, all kind of fit into a smaller uh, number of companies I'm working with. Um, I am really enjoying seeing the benefit of that as part of Proofpoint. So Elusive was acquired by Proofpoint several months ago. 
And Proofpoint has incredible relationships with customers. And um, time after again, I'm in a call where the customers are basically saying, look, we've decided to consolidate across one, two, or three main partners that we have, Proofpoint being one of them. And now let's talk about you know, the various different things that you guys can do. And maybe I can swap out some other technologies that I have in place. So certainly it's interesting now for me to see it on the kind of bigger company, well-established, great relationships with customers side of things and how that consolidation play actually comes into effect. Second thing I'll say is that I think, uh, you know, if my advice to companies is certainly it makes a lot of sense to consolidate as much as you can where you can. I think there are, um, for all of us, we need to figure out what are the, you know, two, three, four really unique things that we have to say, all right, these are areas I have to be the best at. Most of the problems, are, you don't have to be the best. But in some particular areas where you know it's the most um, dangerous, risky from a threat actor perspective and where they might be trying to tackle you, you need to be smart in saying, all right, these are places where I'm willing to, maybe I'll go with a consolidation strategy if that's what's right, or maybe I'll choose a different vendor that provides something further because I have to shine here. That's where I'm vulnerable. But it really has to be a limited set because otherwise it becomes almost impossible to manage. And, and so in sort of exploring that line of thinking and thinking, okay, there, there are certain areas where you really need to be taking on, as, as you mentioned, from teammates' perspective, that, that hacker's perspective. Uh, at, at a certain point, you must have been working at Checkpoint, uh, possibly already developing a rapport with teammate. And at, at a certain point, you must have gotten the, the, the germination of an idea and you suddenly thought, okay, uh, I've wanted to be an entrepreneur and I've got this idea. And ultimately that's the idea that, to my understanding anyway, becomes uh, elusive. And I'd, I'd love to, to hear about, you know, the, the germination of the idea and how it sort of fits in thinking uh, like a hacker and, and ultimately gets uh, to that point where you're doing meetings and, and providing software to customers around the world. Yeah, happy to. So my journey was a little different, a little bit uh, of the non-traditional route, where as opposed to most, uh, which actually come up with an idea while they're at another place and kind of, you know, develop it, see that they like it. And when they're ready to jump in the water, they do. In my particular instance, it kind of went the opposite way. I decided I want to start a company. I don't know what and I don't know with who yet but I'm going to leave Checkpoint and I give notice at Checkpoint and, and free myself time so that I can go out and actually figure out who I start the company with and what do I do. Um, so it was a little bit of a different journey in that respect. And um, I, I did know the teammate folks. We didn't have an idea. Or, there wasn't teammate. It was the people that had just left the army. And so um, we started chatting as well. And um, uh, what what happened is... We spent a good few months, first of all, just a lot of discussions with various types of attackers, right? Like, because when you think about um, cyber offensive, it's not a one size fits all. There's different sub professions within it, which bring different perspectives and different angles to how what offensive looks like. So we spent a lot of time just kind of figuring out where are the most challenging areas in these various sub-professions. What's hard about attacking an organization? What's hard about deploying tools that would go under the radar? What's hard about finding vulnerabilities? All of those things. And um, what happened is we eventually came to kind of this philosophical realization before we even knew what product would fit, but we said, the main fundamental challenge we're seeing now is that security solutions are built with a reactive mindset, meaning that we basically identify things that we've seen in the past or things that are similar to things that we've seen in the past. And when you think about it, so long as that is the case, you are by definition 
playing catch up. The attacker moves and you need to see it at some point, learn it, and then look for something similar. And so long as you're playing catch up, clearly you're going to lose on every so many instances, right? There's always going to be a novel approach to it. So, gee, that doesn't make sense. Is there something we can do that's proactive? Could we turn the table in a way where we're the ones taking the initiative and having the attackers respond to us instead of us responding to the attackers? We kind of like that philosoph philosophical approach. And so we said, all right, like with that philosophy, what could we do? That's, that's great as a, as a sentence, as a statement, as a belief, but how do you actually materialize that and make it into something that can actually be deployed and functioning. And we played around with ideas um, for several months, actually went through multiple different iterations where eventually we uh, came into the realization that deception technology can achieve exactly that. And the intention there is if I'm able to basically paint a world of misinformation for you, and if I can do so in a really, really great way where you can't identify the differences between real and fake, then you have now, every time you need to make a decision, you have a difficult decision to make. Do I take, you know, door A, which is real, or door B, or door C, or door D, which are fake, but they all look the same, and they all feel the same, and I can't identify which which one is the real one and which one is not. And that would exactly lead us to that kind of proactive approach. So we, we like that idea. And again, it went through multiple iterations. And the reason is that what we did once we, we had a, a general direction is we started talking to a lot of customers. Said, look, we, don't, we haven't built anything here yet. But if we were to build this, would this make sense to you? And we, you know, in some places we got sort of, in some places we got, no, guys, you're completely overlooking something. And we just, we learned a lot. We went through iteration after iteration, talking to different customers and tweaking and changing in accordance with what they said would work for them and what wouldn't until we eventually landed in something where we started seeing a lot of nods, a lot of people nodding their heads saying, yeah, like I could use one of those and I'd be willing to pay for one of those. And um, once we did so, we went into really into execution mode and uh, kind of put a lot of emphasis on how can we get something in the hands of customers as quickly as possible. And, you know, strictly the MVP, the minimal viable product, we really went after that, saying we want to put something in the customer's hands to see practically does it make, does it still make sense for them or should we continue to tweak it, change it, iterate over it to find the thing that would actually suit their needs? I'm wondering when you were explaining the idea of deception and, you know, the, the, the need to, uh, make the hacker make sort of the, uh, offensive side of the cybersecurity equation, uh, make a decision, take an action, um, creating sort of whether whether it's and it may not be correct to think of it necessarily as as a fake network maybe it's more of a fake access point amidst you know mixing up fake access points and true access points but you sort of think of what or one of the things that ai seems to be used for today which um may not be great but you you think uh, whether you're in facebook groups or certain other settings the idea of mixing in uh, news or information that may or may not be 100% factually correct, but it's sort of mixed in with all sorts of other information. And, and you kind of get people walking down a path where they could be convinced of things, not necessarily based on 100% uh, truth. So I'm, I'm just wondering, um, years ago, when you were coming up with the way in which to make the hacker see stuff that was not necessarily the true representation of, of reality, were, were you using AI and machine learning to, to get that done? Or is, is it using or was it using something uh, a bit different? We used, uh, we used uh, some of those concepts in order to learn the organization in the best way possible. And part of what we developed into our products is saying, 
Well, if you want to create a world of misinformation that actually will fool the attacker, the stories that you lay out have to be realistic. And part of being realistic means fitting into the rest of the environment. So it, you'll, you'll never find two customers of Elusive or now Proofpoint that have the same deceptions. Each environment is unique. Each environment is different. And it's all based on the actual data, naming conventions, things of that nature that they have inside their company. So we use some of that for uh, learning the organization and basically being able to craft deceptions automatically to fit that organization. It is an interesting comment that you made though, Chris, because when we started the company in 2014, this was a little before the misinformation social networks became a prevalent thing. Um, but exactly to your point, that illustrates just how impactful deception can be. Unfortunately, these tools are being deployed against the general population and the public, which is, as you said, not a great thing. And we have people chasing non-existent things because they're seeing um, short clips about it or reading about it and it looks real. But So that's not a great application of it, but you take that same concept and you now apply it against the people that are attacking you and you can understand how impactful this thing really is. You can really fool the attacker. It, at the end of the day, it's people behind the attack. It's human beings. They're susceptible to the same beliefs or problems or challenges that we all are. And so, yeah, if you mess around with the way they perceive reality, they're going to make some mistakes and you can identify those mistakes. I, w I saw a term when I was just... Uh trying to get, you know, a, again, a, a superficial or rudimentary understanding. Um, and I, I, it caught my attention because I'd seen it in uh, different, different series. Obviously, there are series, there are movies that portray uh, hackers and, and portray some, some of the various things, like, like you were saying, that, that almost super uh, human uh, capability, which, which may not actually be true, but of course, it, it makes for good uh, television and, and multimedia, but uh, the term that they threw out was honeypot, which seemed to be this idea of you're, you're attracting somebody uh, into a, a zone or an area that is actually maybe cut off from the real network. You're, you're fooling them. And when I, when I was personally lining up the concepts side by side, the idea of deception, the idea of a honeypot, it's, it seemed that maybe the idea of the honeypot had occurred years uh, before and deception was was sort of sort, maybe a, a few steps uh, beyond in, in journey because like you're saying all along the hackers are always evolving the defenses always need to be evolving but i i, I was just uh, personally curious if um the honey you would see the honeypot as sort of a, a precursor to uh what what deception really is or if it's uh, something totally different yeah, no, it, it absolutely is a precursor. And I think many of the folks that established uh, the concept of honeypots did a lot of great um, um, foundational work to allow uh, this field to evolve into something that is what is deception today. Honeypots um, have a great, you know, it's a great idea and great philosophy of, again, deceiving the attacker and so on and so forth. What happened early days is that companies found it's, that while the idea is good, it's difficult to deploy because you might be deploying many additional systems inside your environment. So it's hard in that aspect. And then secondly, and maybe more importantly, is that the biggest benefit that you'll get with a honeypot type approach is if you capture the attacker in the honeypot, you can watch the fish in the fishbowl, right? You can study what the attacker is doing. But the story starts with, I caught the attacker in the fish in the honeypot. The, the fish is in the fishbowl. Now you've got to ask yourself, well, why did the fish reach the fishbowl in the first place? I mean, why is it there? How did you do that? And what organizations have found that detecting the attacker and leading him to the honeypot is actually pretty hard. And so we took, uh, we took the same concept, but we evolved the idea quite significantly where we said, you know what? It's less about studying the attacker and it's more about achieving very early detection that I have an attacker in my environment. And so 
the way we've been doing deception is we've been laying deceptive artifacts on every real existing production asset the company has. And so the benefits here are, first of all, it's not hard to deploy. You're not deploying additional systems. You're using what's already there. But then secondly, is that when an attacker lands in that environment and is trying to look around, find their way to the next place, they do so by harvesting information from where they actually already reside, from the machines they've already landed on. And that's exactly where we fool them. So they have they can't take any step without actually going a step further. Um, in that journey, I should say, to augment that a little, is we, when we were, again, crafting deceptions that would be realistic for the attacker, we actually stumbled into another really significant problem, which was that there is way too many low-hanging fruit of real data available to attackers today. We're leaving the keys to the kingdom scattered in so many different places. It's incredible. And, and we saw it because we were starting to gather data in order to craft deceptions. And that actually led to a whole new area that we, um, uh, I'll spare you the whole journey, but that we found out that indeed there is a lot of rolling fruit out there that can be fixed. And particularly, this problem exists as related to people and to identities. There's a lot of passwords, credentials, excessive permissions that are available to attackers that need not be the case. And we can see that and we can fix that. And that led to a whole separate um, product that's kind of complementary and approach that we've taken over the years. And we really did a lot of um, really significant work for our customers and shoring up what their attack surface looks like and really hardening their environment, which also, interestingly enough, is very aligned to the proof point approach, which is, uh, and I love this, I think proof points really hit the nail on its head with it's protect people, defend data. That's what the company does, protect people, defend data. And so it very much resonated with what, what we did and that's a big reason why why we all came together. And and to to that end, when when was because obviously, especially in recent years, so you you start the company in 2014, and you kind of see whether whether it's social media, uh, whether it's certain election results, uh, interest rates, all, all these different things are happening in the world. Uh, when was it that Proofpoint and Elusive came together and, and what color can you sort of sort of put on that? Because obviously some entrepreneurs might, might even be listening. They might be thinking, you know, there's the benefits of staying as an independent company. Others might be thinking there's a benefit partnering up, increased resources, uh, ability to, to complete the mission, expand the mission. Uh, so what was it like to sort of uh, be faced with that decision of do you maintain independence or do you partner up uh, with an organization like Proofpoint? Yeah. Um, so uh, we came together in the latter part of 2022 last year. Um, and uh, yeah, all of the dilemmas you just brought up are, are real, true and fair and important dilemmas that an entrepreneur goes through when, um, when acquisition options are on the table. And there's certainly benefits in going in both directions. And speaking for ourselves, uh, the, what we saw here are two things that kind of from our perspective um, were good for us to, to go ahead and kind of progress. One is, you hit on it earlier, is we wanted, we think we're doing something very, very significant in the security world. And we absolutely realize that there's, you know, 4,000 companies, security companies out there. We absolutely realize that doing it as a standalone startup company is going to be a lot more limited impact than doing it as a much broader, bigger company, bigger brand, bigger um, sales force, and so on and so forth. So uh, coming together with Proofpoint allowed us to really achieve our mission in a, in a much more profound way, which 
Um, again, as a reminder, we're, we are security enthusiasts. We actually really care about what it is that we do, and we want to make an impact. And, and this with Proofpoint, there's a lot more opportunity to make that impact. So that was kind of number one for us. Number two is um, the new home of the company is really, really important. And, and there's a lot that goes into it, but probably above and beyond anything else is what's the culture of this other company that you're considering to partner with. And we had proof point in ourselves. We had a lot of discussions. It was, you know, a lot of interaction before uh, we decided to progress this thing on both ends. And we looked at, and they looked at at the same time, what does the culture of the companies look like? And fortunately, we found that Proofpoint has this fantastic culture. It really, it's, it, um, I continuously am amazed that they've been able to maintain this great culture, you know, just really smart people that are very collaborative. It's as simple as that, but they've been able to maintain that at a very large size. It's a 4,500 employee company. I have said this numerous times to folks in Proofpoint. We had a similar culture, but we were significantly smaller than Proofpoint. It's easier to get done at that size. Being able to maintain that for roughly 20 years and at 4,500 people is quite an impressive uh, achievement. And we saw that very clearly and distinctly. And we said, gee, like this is a place, not only could we be successful, but we could, it will have a lot of fun in the process doing it will enjoy working with these people and and um and and the land will benefits to what it is we're doing so those were the factors in our decision process last year when when you think of the the customers um i mean as again a non-expert listening to the idea of deception the idea of the background i'm sitting there thinking oh my goodness i hope uh, my company has some version of this, or at least something that is able to uh, throw uh, potentially uh, offensive actors off the trail, so to speak, uh, to possibly protect certain uh, important uh, resources. But is is it, in your view, the reason that companies, businesses might not have something like this or might not sign up to it is is the main reason they're they're just not yet aware of what deception is. So maybe deception itself is a, is a concept that hasn't had its moment in the mainstream, or is it frequently that they, they have another provider that they think is, is just as good. I'm, I'm just personally wondering, cause I, I sit back and think cybersecurity of all the thematic topics that we cover at wisdom tree, cybersecurity is really the top of the list in terms of it, it really shouldn't be viewed as an option. Like you need, you may not need, deception, but you need to try to protect your resources, identities, networks, information in some way. Um, I listen to you and think deception sounds extremely credible, but I'm, I'm just curious when, when customers either go a different route or they say, you know what, uh, that sounds great, but we can't do it. I mean, what, what is the reason that that holds them back uh, and that ultimately then holds back the, the growth of the revenue and, and ultimately the space uh, as we see it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, on the customer's end of things, it's really challenging these days. As I mentioned earlier, there's, and it really depends on, you know, which report you read, but you have roughly 4,000 cyber companies. And guess what? There's 4,000 cyber companies with messaging that is very similar, despite being very different technologies, solving different problems and so on and so forth. Now, if you sit in the CISO's chair and the security leader's chair, gee, that's a daunting task. You're being called by 4,000 different companies, hearing the same message, but each one's taking a little bit of a different approach. What do you do? Right? So deception is, is absolutely one, one thing you can do, and it has a lot of benefits, and clearly I believe in it in a very big way. But there's another 3,999 things you could do, right? And, and how do you make that distinction and so on? So it's, it's a challenging spot, I'll just say, kind of out of the gate. Um, deception has been adopted by traditionally by more um, mature cyber uh, mature companies. I think a lot of that is perception 
that when you think about, forget the world of cyber for a second, when you think about just deception general kind of in our head, it fits the counterintelligence kind of area and so on. It sounds very sophisticated. So the more sophisticated companies were the kind of earlier adopters of this. They were the ones that to kind of embrace it first. But um, it's that's more of a misperception than reality because while the, the means to do it is quite advanced, the deployment of deception is actually pretty simple and pretty easy to stand up. And so more and more companies, we're actually seeing a pretty significant uptick in the market um, over the course of the last several months and, and year plus that um, there's a lot of interest from less mature companies now in the world of deception. I think a lot of kind of been doing some some things that were very, very hot, like EDR in the last few years. Many already have done that, and now they're looking to take it to the next level and coming around to things like the world of deceptions. With that said, with the way we approach this anyway is for companies that didn't feel they were mature enough for this type of technology, um, we had realized pretty early that everyone needs a fundamental and foundational capability of identifying their low hanging identity risk and fixing that. And that's, you know, kind of, it's a, it's a, it comes before deception on the maturity curve, right? It's kind of, how do you find where you have gaps in your environment today? Where are you making it easy for attackers? And how do you stop that from happening? How do you fix that? in a way that can scale very easily and isn't a big burden. And so we saw a lot of adoption of, it, it, our product is called Spotlight, which basically finds these problems, fixes these problems for customers continuously. And is there adoption, because we talked about sort of the maturity of the companies and how that is evolving. Uh, another angle that you sometimes see um, and some, sometimes depending on how the articles are written, it could be a, a bit scary where you, you've got on the one hand, your very, very large financial institution, where if you think about it, a lot of the resource of a financial institution is credibility and, you know, ones and zeros representing the accounts of all the different people and money being uh, very much uh, an electronic thing uh these days rather than a physical thing so it's it's very much sort of in the more virtual or technology centric uh, world but then on the other end of the spectrum you you have you know the water company or other sorts of more physical infrastructure things that will always be more physical infrastructure just by virtue of what they are and you you tend to see that the protection or some of the best practices may, maybe aren't even done at some of these uh, more physically based organizations. And I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering in your experience, do you see a more even adoption or do you see adoption more in the direction of the companies like financial institutions where it's, it's almost all about the network and very little about the physical world? Yeah, We're, we certainly see. So the financial institutions are typically earlier adopters of security technology than, uh, than others. Um, because to your point, uh, they are more mature, they have more funding available and they take it kind of to the next level. So certainly the banks and such, and certainly the bigger banks, um, have a lot of the, the newer and more sophisticated stuff. It is, uh, to your point, uh, when you see some of the other environments with like physical infrastructure, um, I'll say we kind of, it runs the gamut, right? We see some companies who are doing a phenomenal job and really have their their shop tightened up and then others which have huge gaps and to be perfectly frank it's kind of scary because gee like if you're a critical infrastructure company and you're stuck at like the very basics of cyber security that could impact a lot of people in a very profound way and um you know when I'm in with these companies, you know, I'm wearing my cyber professional hat on, on the one side, but also my citizen hat on the other side. 
And it's, it's scary. It really is. And um, I think, unfortunately, I think we're yet to see some really, really impactful things that attackers can absolutely do in the physical world through cyber attacks where they've, to an extent, held themselves back because, you know, you, you cross a certain threshold where it could be an outright war or it could lead to retaliations and things of that nature, which could be kind of devastating. But eventually somebody will pull a trigger which will have, you know, very devastating impact in a broad way, I, I feel. Um, so it is scary. Um, regulated industries in general tend to be further ahead than non-regulated industries. Um, again, because it drives kind of funding, it drives awareness, it drives those types of things. But um, yeah, back to the basic of your question, the, the, the financial institutions are really the, usually the most forward thinking there. One, one of the big issues uh, these days, and maybe... We, we, we've mentioned uh, generative AI and, and AI a few times on, on the uh, discussion here. So as we, as we get close uh, to, the, to the tail end here, um, I, I figured I, I had to get your perspective on a problem within cybersecurity that gets cited often, namely uh, there is a lot of risk. We've, we've mentioned a lot of it uh, in our discussion. And then you think of how, how many people have the specialized cybersecurity skills, the, the cybersecurity professionals out there, um, depending on the, the article or the stat that you see, uh, could, could be a few million uh, in terms of the shortage or, or what have you. But do, do you think this is a problem where we're, we're ultimately going to, through higher salaries or other opportunities attract more people into the space? Or do you think ultimately you can't attract enough people, so you have to solve the issue more and more with technology, part, pr potentially even artificial intelligence, to become more efficient with the cyber professionals, uh, ultimately, that you do have. Yeah. Eventually, I think it has to be solved with technology. Um, I don't think it, the technology is going to solve it all, but we have to augment the people with significant technology to ease up the operational day to day there is too large a gap with um how much how many cyber professionals we actually need and what exists out there and it's such a fast moving uh field and it's such a challenging field you think about you know the cybersecurity market versus other markets no other market has smart people actively attacking the stuff that we're building right it's you don't have it in other areas if i build a marketing company my biggest challenge is maybe the competition, but nobody's actively trying to bypass what I'm doing, right? That very much happens in the cyber world, which leads to this really, really fast pace of uh, development. And so I don't think people um, will ever have enough people or enough expertise to solve the problem. We have to do it through means like generative AI and, and beyond uh, that will, will help us get the job done. The, uh, the final question that I wanted to ask, I feel, I feel I'd be remiss not to, not to ask it, obviously. Uh, you, generative AI, it's a tool that can be used for positive things uh, as well as negative things. Uh, as a professional in cybersecurity, have, have you seen people, hackers, offensive actors starting to try to use these large language models in a way that enhances their capability to attack uh, systems, or is this uh, not, or like, like you said, maybe the low hanging fruit is so prevalent that they don't even really need to uh, get uh, get that advanced uh, with it. I, I'm, I'm just personally uh, curious there if, uh, if you're seeing yet large language models being used uh, for attacking purposes. We are, we're starting to see it and no question it's going to be used very, very widely. Um, Actually, speaking on, you know, one of the one of the things Proofpoint is known for is email security. Still, the number way number one way to get into an organization or or get the data or get the money or what have you is through email, right? There's still we all get phishing emails. We all have malware delivered to us via email. So that's still the number one way for attackers to kind of penetrate an organization. Proofpoint is is the leader in that space. Um, 
when attackers are crafting messages, Gen AI can play a really big role there because now I don't need to write up a message that tells Chris a very unique and specific uh, message I want to deliver to Chris, but rather I ask Gen AI to craft that message for me. And then across all of the different places they'll send it, I'll, it'll be able to craft it automatically with variations and so on and so forth. So it's, it's beneficial for sure for attackers. They can scale their operation in a much, much easier way that way, as well as solve for some things like crafting it with proper English and not making mistakes on you know, spelling or what have you, which happens in some of the attacking instances. So we've started seeing that being used. We can fortunately detect those things in a very good way today. I think we're going to find that it's going to increase and we're going to find more and more attacks that the messages were crafted by a Gen AI or a large language model. Well, uh, I think that's an excellent place uh, for us to wrap up uh, our discussion. We've been speaking with uh, Ofer Israeli, GVP, General Manager, Identity Threat Defense at Proofpoint. Um, it's been a great uh, discussion. We've gone on quite a journey uh, today. So I certainly want to thank uh, Ofer. I want to also thank uh, all of our listeners uh, to The Next Big Thing. And please uh, rate the podcast, subscribe to the podcast if uh, you like what you hear. And we'll look uh, forward to being able to deliver our next episode. So Ofer, thank you. And thank you everyone for listening today. Thank you, Chris. It was a pleasure chatting with you.